morning. We well, welcome everybody who is here at 601 Fairview Street and those who are watching all across the World Wide Web. Uh, my name is Walt Tanner, one of the pastors here at Capstone. Uh, and before we kind of finish out our winning the war in your mind series, uh, let me tell you kind of where we're heading for the rest of the month. Uh, next week is our uh, graduation Sunday. And so we've got, we're excited to be celebrating some of our seniors. Uh, and so that's going to be happening next Sunday, specifically uh, second service. We're going to be uh, giving out gifts and recognizing uh, all of our seniors and CJ Bishop, uh, the face of our students uh, for Edge Student Ministry will be uh, bringing the word. So we're excited to be having CJ here on the stage. Uh, and then the week after that, we're going to be having our Serve Sunday. And if you, you're here for the first time or, or you really just think, hey, this is just kind of like a little contemporary church, a little smaller than some other bigger ones, you're going to see and hear why we are different. Uh, we are literally going to, we're going to cancel Sunday morning uh, here at 61 Fairview Street and we're going to send you guys out. One of the reasons is just we think differently. Uh, and so make sure you stay for uh, all of that. That it's Chris shares a little bit more. So today we finish up our, uh, our winning the war in our mind. And how many people, let me see the hands of the people uh, follow along at home as well. How many people have ever heard of fight or flight? All right, a majority of us. Good job. We've, we've heard about that. Again, this is when, uh, when something happens to us and we are filled with this understanding of danger and we're filled with kind of anxiety. These chemicals get released throughout our body. We don't really, we, again, we either respond and we fight we stand and we're ready to fight whatever we need to do, or we run. And it's basically your brain switches uh, and basically says, hey, get ready because something bad is about to happen. And so as we talk about our mind, we need to talk about this understanding of fight or flight. And so throughout this series, we've been looking at scripture of understanding how to win this war in our mind, but also science and how these two things often go together. A lot of times we can think that science is against scripture, but reality is that the more and more that we learn about science and the world and even the universe, it actually validates and supports what scripture says. And so uh, today, as we kind of talk about this, this part of our brain, this fight or flight, is the uh, I'm Agmandal, I see, I, first service, I tried to say it and I couldn't, I'm gonna try it again. The Agmandala, uh, that will butcher it, I'm sure. But it's this part of your brain uh, that basically is the primitive part of your brain that you don't really have to think, all right? You don't have to think about it. It's the part of your brain, it's this fight or flight. It's, it's what makes your, your heart beat. You don't have to think about your breath. It, it what makes you breathe. It's this natural part of you. But a part of it is that, again, the amygdala, amygdala is not a, where I'm going to say it 10 different times. At one point, I'll get it right. You're right. But the idea is that even though it's small, it's only about this big in your brain, that it, it can actually control a very large part of where you go. It controls a large part of your thoughts. It controls a large part of how you win this war in your mind. Again, it kind of deals with your past. We talked some last week about your cognitive bias, about what happened in your past or the way that you grew up and the, and the facts and the truths that are in front of you and how you filter those in your brain. And the same thing of, of how you deal with things in your life, that there, there may have been something that we know someone who, there was a fire growing up, they had their whole house burned down. And so anytime they smell smoke, their brain lights up with this sense of, hey, we gotta run because remember what happened to us. And so it begins to light up. Or maybe you were building a tree house or climbing a tree one time and you fell. And so now anytime you get up on a ladder or you get look up at the height, your brain kicks on and going, hey, remember what happened last time we tried uh, to do this. Uh, for me, it's when the phone rings at, um, at six o'clock. At six o'clock, anytime the phone rings, my heart starts beating really, really fast. Now, for most of you, you're like, well, why, what's the big deal? It's probably a telemarketer. Well, right after me and Betsy got married, um, I was a youth pastor at the church down in North Augusta, and uh, someone had asked to speak at a school event. And I said, sure, I'd love to speak at that school event. Well, I totally forgot about it. Didn't go, didn't think about it. Uh, and then I got a phone call about six, six o'clock. And they said, hey, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm perfectly fine. What's wrong? He's like, well, you were supposed to be here and you didn't show up. And I was like, wah, wah, like, like, a part of me is if I tell you I'm going to do something, I'm going to finish it, I'm going to do it, I'm going to lead everything I can to it, and, and that hurt, and I was like, oh no, I for totally forgot. And so 15 years later, the phone rings at dinner time. my brain kicks on and goes, what did I forget? Where am I supposed to be? And, my, and I, my, I get nervous, and it, it happened a long time ago, but that part of my brain, my thoughts begin to run away uh, in understanding of what that is. 
That Agmandala is it's a good thing. It's meant to protect you, but it is, it is also, it, it doesn't have a filter. It basically, it's not subjective. It's easily triggered. You have irrational thoughts. Just like when a phone rings, I automatically think about what I forgot to do. But reality is, is it's just someone calling me or touching base. I haven't done that since. But the idea that it's irrational thoughts of what that looks like. And when our thoughts are away, they can spiral out of control and they can lead us to unhealthy places. And there's some of us that have lived that out is that because of that, that fight or flight or something that happened to us a long time ago, when something happens in front of us, our minds run. And a lot of us end up in unhealthy places. Some of us self-medicate in, in different ways because of what's happened to us. But luckily, God in his perfect plan also gave us the prefrontal cortex. That's the logical part of your brain. It's what, it's what helps you process things. And so when you have those irrational thoughts, this is the part that brings you back and say, hey, it's okay, you, you don't need to worry. And so as, as we talk about that, um, I'll kind of talk about something. Betsy and I, uh, as foster parents, uh, we have to do lots of different trainings. And one of the trainings we had to do is, is dealing with uh, tra- kids who've been through traumatic situations and, and how their brain works and how to parent them and, and how to do the best we can. And so one of the things we learned back then is called, not back then, but we still actually apply today, is called flipping your lid. All right, so we flip our lid. So I'm gonna give you, this is gonna change some of your lives. It may change your parenting, may change how you look at your brain, but it's the understanding of how your brain works. So everybody hold up your palm like this, all right? So this is your palm. All right, this your thumb, and you put it right here. This is this is your augmental. This is your primal. This is what this is what basically you were born with this, and it works really really well as soon as you breathe. All right, you wake up, your heart keeps beating, you're breathing. That's why babies cry when they're when they're hungry, when they need something. It's because this right here, this primal piece. All right, now take your four fingers and wrap them around your thumb. All right, now you've got your brain. This is your prefrontal cortex, all right? You can put your hands down. All right, so this is your prefrontal cortex. Notice what happens. This, the logical piece, wraps around the primal piece, all right? So ultimately, God created our brains, our minds, that this is the primal. This is really, really important. Like, you can't live without this. But then you get this, this logical piece that wraps around. So here's what happens is when uh, your prefrontal cortex is working, uh, it's the understanding of, hey, I'm able to, to filter things and make logical choices. Now, here's the thing with kids and as, we are, as, as parents and as we understand that the prefrontal cortex, kids are born with this working really well. This is not fully developed until your 20, mid-20s. All right, that's why you can't rent a car till you're 25. Is that right there, okay? <laughs> Rental companies decide along. We're not gonna give keys to anyone who doesn't own the car until the prefrontal cortex is fully developed. But no, this is why, this is why you cannot have a logical a conversation with a child when they want candy before dinner, all right? This is why as teenagers, you did a lot of dumb stuff. And in your early 20s, you're like, oh, okay, because this prefrontal cortex was not fully developed. That's why you got that tattoo where you got that tattoo, okay? Right here. So as we think about our brains, that's what happens. Now here, now as kids go through trauma or your kids respond in a certain way, when something they don't like happens, they flip their lid. They lose all cognitive parts of their body to be able to make, tra- and they just yell and they scream and they throw tantrums. You're like, that's why my kid makes that primal animal sound is this right here, okay? Because, because they flip their lid because they're not able to make their logical decisions. And so they flip that lid, especially if they've been through trauma, if they've, they've had things in their life. And, and ultimately, uh, you know, as adults, we do the same thing. So when you lose it, when you get angry, when you get frustrated and you respond in an unhealthy way, you, te- you literally flip your lid because you respond not out of the cognitive part of the front, but you're responding here. All right, and so this is the dangerous part where we gotta realize, and some of us, is, and Betsy and I understand, when one of us flips our lid, they tap us out, all right? You done, all right? You have flipped your lid, you need to get that primal out of here, you need to come back and be able to have a normal conversation with our kid, all right? So as we talk, you're like, well, thanks for the science lesson, what does this have to do with the Bible? Well, this has all to do with how we respond and how we win the war in our minds. Let's jump in 1 King verse 19, uh, chapter 19, verse four. And so as we talk about the, the being able to flip our lid, Elijah, he's a prophet of the Lord, he flips his lid. Now, let me kind of tell you what leads up to him flipping his lid. 
So he is again, going against some uh, Baal prophets and the Baal prophets were, they, there's a false God named Baal. And he said, hey, I, let's, let's make a big bonfire. And he's like, you pray to your God and let's see if he can light it. They spend days praying. He says, he mocks them and says, hey, maybe you're not praying loud enough. They cut themselves and worship. They try to do all these things and nothing happens. So Elijah says, okay, it's my turn. So he says, here, I'm gonna make it even harder. Let's go ahead and pour a bunch of water on the wood because that makes it harder to light. They said, sure, whatever. Our God didn't respond. Yours won't either. He prays a prayer. Lightning comes down, lights it up on fire. Great, great win for the kingdom. Great, great win for Elijah. Great, great win for the Lord. He is mighty. He is good. But ultimately, then he gets word, Elijah gets word that the most evil queen of the, of, of the Bible, uh, Jezebel, basically puts a hit on him, puts a bounty on his head. He says, for what has happened, I will kill him. Well, Elijah flips his lid. He's like, I'm done. I'm out of it, God. I've done all this stuff. I'm going to go run and hide. I'm the only one left. He has a pity party. And he says, there's no way I can survive this, God. He flips his lid. He doesn't have cognitive understanding of what that looks like. So he flips his lid. This is what it says in 1 Kings 19.4. It says, but he himself went on a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. He said and asked, he said, might I die? Saying, is it enough, Lord? to take away my life, for I am no better than my father. So he has had just an amazing, God has done an amazing work through him. He gets some bad news and he's like, enough is enough. I can't handle this anymore, God. I can't handle the pressure. I can't handle the stress. I can't handle, he's like, actually, I wish you would just go ahead and take my life. These negative thoughts run. Remember, we talked about when we have, when, when that fight or flight moves, he, he, he runs where he makes irrational decisions, says irrational statements. I wish I could just die. He flips his, his lid. And here's the thing, that we could do the same thing, that we could see God do amazing things. We can see God moving in mighty ways that God can be working where you work, learn, live, and play in your, as a missionary. And God's using you and you're learning, but there could be that one thing that just causes you to lose it causes you to flip your lid. And you're just like, all right, God, I'm done. I, I don't wanna have anything else to do. I am, I'm finished. But just like Elijah, here's what happens. We get fixated on the presence of our problems and we lose focus on the presence of God. Let me say that again. We get fixated on the presence of our problems. We get fixated on the presence of our problems and we lose the focus of the presence of God. So God finds Elijah and he's hiding. He literally is hiding in a cave and he walks in. You can keep reading this in 1 Kings 19. And he says, Elijah, what are you doing? Literally, he says it. He says it twice. He says, Elijah, what are you doing? He says, I'm done. He says, I'm the only one left. There's no other warriors out there. There's nobody else fighting for you, God. Why am I the only one carrying this burden? And God just shakes his head. He says, look, Elijah, go to the entrance of the cave, and I'm going to give you a message. And it says that this loud windstorm comes, and Elijah's like, nothing. Fire comes out of the clouds and it goes by and it's nothing. An earthquake happens and nothing. And it says, but then a, a, a still small voice just kind of wraps himself around Elijah. And, he, and basically God gives him the message, like, hey, I'm going to anoint you. I'm going to have you anoint a new king and BTW. There's 7,000 more warriors waiting for you to go fight. So stop having a pity party. Pick yourself up and let's go. God says, look, Elijah, don't hide. Don't allow the presence of your problems to lose focus on the presence of me. So here's your first point, that we need to hear God's whispers. We need to hear God's whispers. So there are many of us, we're in caves. Some of you as students, like I can't do it anymore. Or some of you as parents, or some of you as neighbors or missionaries or wherever you're at, you're like, you know what? I, there's no more, I can't do this any longer. So we go into our caves and they were like, okay, God, if you want me to leave the cave, if you want me to go do something big, if you want me to go, I need a sign. I need something. I need something in my life that's going to reveal yourself to me. So I need an earthquake or I need a firestorm or I need something to reveal yourself to me. But I think God reminds Elijah and us that it's not the storms or the earthquakes that's gonna get our attention. It's remembering that God is near. And when God is near, he doesn't have to yell. Let me say that again. When God is near, he doesn't have to yell. 
that sometimes it's that we need to lean into God to hear his whispers and not be looking to win the, the, uh, the Powerball to know that God is real or the understanding that God gives you that job that you want or you get that raise. But maybe we just need to lean in and hear his whisper. Like if it's, if it's in a loud room or you're at a concert or you're at a, a movie and somebody's trying to whisper, you're leaning into what they're saying and you're focusing on, dis, not focusing on the distractions, but you're leaning into what they're saying and trying to, to interpret that. Why? Because you're close. And maybe God might just be telling us if we're in that cave and we flipped our lid and we're done and we're finished and these, these toxic thoughts are in our minds that maybe he just says, hey, you need to just slow down. It might be that we just need to sit and be still. Maybe we need to stop running from God and just stay and listen carefully to the soft, calming voice of our creator. So if you find yourself in that cave, if, you've, if you flip that lid and you're making irrational decisions and you really don't know, maybe we need to lean in on that. And I would say that happens in community, that happens in scripture and, and where we're gonna finish next, which is in prayer. So when we flip our lid and we have these negative, this negative pathways in our head and we end up in a cave, so what? Well, we go back to week one. We have these, well, we talked about these strongholds. The second Corinthians 10 says that we have the divine power to destroy these strongholds, to basically take our thoughts and make them captive for Christ. So when we find ourselves there, just like Elijah who flips his lid is not having rational thoughts, he's, that's a stronghold that we, where do we need to do? So let's go to uh, Philippians 4. Four through seven. We've already looked at Philippians four eight. Remember, it said, "Focus on your thought. Your, set your mind on these things. Whatever is noble, whatever is true, whatever is praiseworthy, whatever is commendable. That's what you should be thinking about. Don't think about the garbage and the trash of this world, but focus on the things of the Lord." Romans eight. So now it says this in Philippians four. Verse four it says, "Rejoice in the Lord again." I say, "Rejoice." So that's important. Paul says, "Rejoice." Let me tell you one more time. If you didn't catch it up the first time, rejoice. It says rejoice, let your reasonableness, let that frontal right here, the frontal lobe right here, the reasonableness, let your reasonableness be known to everybody, that you're rational, that you make good choices, that you have wisdom and discernment, not that you just fly off and make rash decisions. But the idea, let your reasonableness be known to everyone that the Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind. There you go. A little slow, but we're catching up. Will guard your heart and your mind. All right. Winning the war in our minds in Christ Jesus. All right, so if we're gonna do that, we gotta start with understanding what prayer is. So let's start there. Prayer changes everything. Well, Walt, it says pray for everything. It is, that's a lot. Well, let me kind of, let me interpret kind of the Greek of that word everything for you. The Greek word for everything means everything, anything, all things. It literally means everything. That prayer should be a part of who we are in an overflow. And that's what it says. So when you pray for everything, it says rejoice. I say again, rejoice. Praise. When our presence is on the Lord and not on our problems, we will praise. Why? Because we are in prayer. When these two things work together, we get this rejoice principle. The rejoice principle is simply this, that we're praising him and that we're praying. These two things go together in winning the war in our mind. It says when you pray, you're gonna have a peace. Now this peace as Christ followers confuses people. It confuses people, and Paul tells them that. He says, look, the peace you're gonna have, it surpasses all understanding. People who don't have Jesus won't get it. This week, some of you guys, you decided, you, you, you and Matt Damon, you decided to get into cryptocurrency, and you lost a lot of money. And you're like, you know what? It's okay, because ultimately, my peace is not in that stuff. Or the peace of that you lost a job or the peace that you're not getting to that school you want to or that peace of fill in the blank of the understanding that when we pray, we have a peace and that peace gives us, a, a, gives us something that no one else has. And, it says, and when you have that peace, guess what it does? It guards your heart and your mind. It allows you to make good choices, not to have irrational thoughts and the understanding of if we do flip our lid, what do we do? Praise and prayer. 
that we come back and that we wrap that around just, just reacting, which is what most of the world does, by the way. Most of the world just reacts. They respond. And so they're, they're, they're reactive, not proactive. Paul's telling you this. Hey, let's be proactive. Let's be in prayer and praise. And let's see how God works. How are we gonna reframe our responses? That's what we said the last week. We, we talked about re, reframing our responses. We can't control what happens to us. We can't control what the stock market does. We can't control if there's a recession coming. We can't control if we're in a housing bubble. We can't control if we get our, keep our job. We can't, keep, we can't control any of that. Here's what we can't control, what we praise, who we praise, and how we pray. How are you reframing your response of what's just not happening to you, but it's happening around you? Are you acting like everybody else who watches this news channel or this news channel? Are you really acting like, again, are you following the crowd? Are you following Jesus? How are you reacting to what is happening on you? Here's, here's uh, what Paul says. Here's what we normally do. When we're out of options, we say this. I guess, I, uh, I guess all we can do now is pray. Because why? That's our last resort. We're out of options. We're going to have to pray. Paul says, no, no, don't let prayer be your last line of defense. Let it be your first line of offense. Don't be the last thing that you do because God's right. It's like, you're right. You tried everything and guess what? You got zero, zilch, nothing. You don't have peace. You haven't guarded your heart. You haven't guarded your mind because you've tried to fix it. He says, but if you start with praising me, even if you don't understand it and the prayer of how you're gonna get through it, you are already way ahead. You're not just reacting but you're able to make good choices, wise choices, godly choices. Not just run, run and hide in a cave and have a pity party. Beginning, okay, God, here I am. I don't really understand it. I'm struggling with why she wants to not cut my head off. God, why would you even want me to do that when I did such a good thing for you and now I'm having to suffer? And God says, hey, I, my, Isaiah 55, we said this last week, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. I'm in control Prayer changes everything, how we reframe, how we respond, this, this chemical that happens in our brain. Dr. Leaf, she's a neurologist. Uh, she focuses on a thing called, I didn't know this was a thing, but neurotheology of how your brain focuses on the view of God. And she has a book. If you like, if you like this kind of stuff, I encourage you to read it. Uh, and the understanding is called Switch on Your Brain. But she says this, you see the quote up on the screen. It says, it's been found that 12 minutes of daily Focused prayer over an eight week period can change the brain to such an extent that it can be measured on a brain scan. So that sounds a lot like Romans 12 too. Don't be conformed to this world, but be renewed, be renewing your mind. How do you renew your mind? By prayer and praise. So it literally is saying, if you do what the Bible says, your brain will change and science can prove it. It's kind of funny. It's like God almost created the brain. And it's just now that he created the brain, then he gives us this thing that says, hey, if you want your brain to work well, I can tell you how it works. And the idea that, that literally science has shown that if we spend focused time in prayer, it literally changes your brain. And we begin to see that, man, God really is in control. And that prayer, and I don't really care about your prayers. They can be formal and you can use a lot of these and owls. It could be informal. You can say, hey, God, what's up? It could be written. It could be saying. It could be journaled. I don't really care how you pray. I just think we're called to pray. And I think when we do pray, when we do what Philippians 4 says, and it's gonna guard our heart, and we're gonna have this peace, and it's gonna guard our thoughts, then it's literally gonna change your way that you think. It's gonna allow you to not be so flipping your lid all the time, and losing that battle, but beginning to win the war of going, okay, here's how Jesus would respond. Here's how he would have compassion. Here's how he would build a bridge, not burn a bridge. And here's what, that's what we've been doing a lot. A lot of, and I said this last week, with what's happening in society and culture and politics and all the things that are happening, is many of us have been doing this because we watch a news channel, or we've been doing this because someone said something I didn't agree with. And we do this versus the idea of going, hey, how can I have a conversation with someone who might think differently than me? Praise and prayer. It literally transforms your brain. And again, so again, how, you're like, well, I don't really know how to pray. I don't really pray a lot. Reps, we talked about this when rewiring your brain. Steph Curry takes 500, makes 500 shots a day 
On game days, he takes 200 to 300 shots a day, makes them. Muscle memory. The more you pray, the better you'll get at it. The more you pray, the more comfortable and natural it will be. So it may be choppy. You may be like learning how to drive a stick shift and you got whiplash because you're going back and forth. But ultimately, you'll be able to get on the highway one day. But it's just continual practice, continual going, hey God, I'm going to commit this week, three times this week, I'm going to pray, or four times, or five times, or I'm going to turn off the radio on the way to school or work, and I'm just going to lift up a prayer for my day or something that's happening around me that I'm going to, because prayer changes everything, even our brains. All right, so here's the last, the last point is this. We need to hear God's whispers. We, we need to understand that prayer changes everything, and then this, that we need to keep our guard up, keep your guard up. So people come to me a lot of times like, Walt, my marriage is in trouble or Walt, I'm trying to parent this teenager or Walt, we've, we've got this issues in my life or hey, I've got this addiction. Uh, can you give me a Bible verse? Can you tell, how can I fix my life? And ultimately, look, it's not about fixing your life and following rules. It's about following Jesus. And so they say, I wanna really follow Jesus. And guess what they do? They start reading their Bible and they start praying and they start being in community with other believers who think like Jesus and live like Jesus in his words and ways. And guess what happens? Their marriage gets better because they realize it's not about being served, but serving others. And they realize that their finances are not theirs, but God's. They start being radically generous and and the stress of debt is no longer there. And and they begin to actually live again. It's almost like God created you and tells you the best life you can have is following him and doing what he calls you to do. They start doing that and things get good. But as things get better, guess what? They don't feel like they have to pray as much. They don't feel like they need to be in community anymore. They're not really going to church and they're not hanging out. And so they begin to kind of let their guard down. And as they let their guard down, then again, now the strongholds that used to be broken now begin to get bit, built back up. Uh, a, 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 verse, a, a sermon I listened to on tape, there used to be these things called tape ministries, all right? So the churches used to make copies of tapes. If you kids don't know what tape is, Google it. Um, so they were cassette tapes and I was listening. I was on Pleasantburg. I can tell you where I was in Greenville when I heard this, uh, but it was a sermon on 1 Peter 5, 8. And it says that, uh, be sober-minded and watchful. Your adversary the, is the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking those he may devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. We said most battles are won or lost in your mind. But the moment that we let our guard down, yes, things were tough. So we, we started fighting and we started winning the wars. We kind of close out this series. Man, we started putting our hands up and, and, and we were good and, and, and we started fighting and we started winning. But then we started winning and we started kind of putting our hands down and we weren't in the word as much as we were. We weren't praying like we were. We weren't having gospel conversations like we were. And so we put our guard down. And what does it say? Here's the thing. Even though you may get tired and we may get lazy and we may not want to go to church, we not want to do the quote unquote church Jesus things. Can I tell you the enemy waits for you to let your guard down and strikes. It says he walks around like a roaring lion seeking those he may devour. So again, he's looking at the image of Africa. He's looking for the one who gets separated from the crowd, the one who doesn't keep up, the one who gets tired, the one who decides, hey, you know what? It's not worth it. My life is good now. He says, that's when he pounces. Be alert. Be alert with your thoughts. Be alert with who you are. Be alert with what that looks like. And so a few years ago, you know, I, I, uh, in college and from my 20s and 30s, I I, I was lifting weights. That's pretty obvious by by my build. Y'all know that. Um, but I decided I was getting too old to cling and to deadlift and to bench and all that stuff. And so I decided uh, to start doing nine rounds, start doing HIT, high intensity training. See Archie back there, you need to make sure I get a discount for this free advertisement I'm giving for you for nine rounds. So I started doing nine rounds. And one of the things that, you know, the trainers say is you gotta keep your guard up. You gotta keep your guard up because if you don't, here's what happens. You get your face smashed in, all right? This is the moneymaker, guys, right here. Can't get, can't, can't get this smashed in. So you gotta keep, your, gotta keep your guard up. And here's one of the things I've learned that I've, as I would keep my guard up, the reason I would start letting it is because I'd either get tired because they, my arms are so tired and they're, they're, by the end I, I get to now round eight and I can't keep my hands up. So you, you get tired or you get comfortable. Like, hey, I can do this. I don't need, I don't need to, and you can watch guys who are boxing MMA or they put their hands down and then they get their face smashed in. 
Why? Because they didn't keep their guard up. And so doing drills, and it's always keep your hands up, keep your hands up, strike, keep your hands up. So the idea of how do we keep our guard up, here's the thing, praise and prayer. Like when you get tired of going, okay, God, how can I praise? All right, God, what can I praise you for today? Keep this up. Because Satan's gonna come at you and you go, hey, I'm praising the Lord. He gave me breath today. Come on, devil, what you got? Or going, hey, God, what can I pray for today? Who can I pray for? And that doubt that comes at you and you begin, you block, but you just don't block, but then you counter because you now prayer is not just my last thing, it's now my first thing. It's the idea that I am resisting, I am being alert, I am being aware of what's around me. I'm not gonna get tired and I'm not gonna get lazy because I'm not gonna get my face smashed in or I don't wanna be devoured because the enemy does not give up. He wants you to fail. And so it's not that, oh, we did a four week series about our mind and I thought about these things and I did my homework and I, I wrote down all these things. And it's like, okay, God, now I'm going to keep my guard up. I'm gonna keep praising you no matter what. I'm gonna to continue to be prayerful because prayer changes my mind and it praises my thoughts. And when I pray it, guess what? It gives me this peace that surpasses all understanding and it guards my mind, heart and my mind. So I'm gonna keep my hands up. All right, so everybody put your left hand up. All right, say praise. praise. All right, put your right hand up. Say prayer. prayer. All right, so this is how we keep our guard up. All right, guys? Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, belt, let's go, let's go. All right, so the understanding of you gotta keep your guard up. You can't, you can't, and that's where, and I've seen this, guys, we've been doing this for 13 years, and I've seen it. People come and go, man, yeah, let's go, let's go, let's go. And then they get devoured. And we just go, ah, why didn't they stay in community? Why didn't they keep praising and praying? They got tired, or they got lazy. We gotta stay, continue, because he is with us. He is near us. So here's your big idea, it's real easy. It's the rejoice principle is all about guarding our hearts and thoughts through prayer and praise. Guarding our hearts and our thoughts through prayer and praise. I'm gonna keep my guard up. I wanna lean in. I wanna lean into those whispers of the Lord. And so I need to maybe just be still and I need to listen. And then I need to go, okay, God, what can I pray for? How can I praise you today? I want to rejoice. That's where joy comes from. I'm rejoicing. It's not about happiness of the haphazardness of what's in your circumstances, but I want to rejoice. And that's not about just my circumstances. It's rejoicing in Jesus. It's rejoicing in not my situation, but my Savior. That's how we're able to keep our hands up. And, as I, and some of us may need to memorize 1 Peter 5.8. Some people ask me, say, you know, there are some pastors, and, and I was having a conversation last week with somebody of, of a pastor, and they had moral failure, and, and they're like, you know, you know, how do you guard yourself against moral failure? I was like, I pretty much say I can do it all. Like, I never say, oh, I won't have an affair. You know what? I can. Guess what that makes me do? Keep my hands up. Uh, I'll never look at pornography. Actually, it's pretty easy to look at pornography. I'm gonna keep my hands up. Because the moment that I say, oh, I would never have an affair, the moment I would never get trapped in addiction, wow, because I'm putting my hands down, but I need to pray, God, give me the strength to stay strong and pure. God, give me the wisdom and the discernment, not to just respond, but the idea of going, hey, I wanna plan. I'm gonna stay away from sin. I'm gonna be alert. I'm gonna make sure. So the moment you say, well, I would never fill in the blank, the devil just said, oh, here we go. He said they wouldn't. Oh, I got some tricks for them. And so we need to understand if we're gonna win this war, the devil will come at us, the enemy will come at us, and it's just not him, he's not omnipresent, he's not like God, but he has a legion of angels. And I do believe a principality of darkness and good and that we will be attacked. So what does that look like? So we've started, we started this series with this, of our lives follow the direction of our thoughts. That's how we started this whole thing. Our lives follow the direction of our thought. And we ask this question, are you okay with where your thoughts are taking you? Are you okay with where your thoughts are taking you? Are your thoughts taking you to an affair? Are your thoughts taking you to fill in the blank? Are you satisfied? Or are you going, man, my thoughts are not taking me to Jesus. Take captive your thoughts to obey Jesus, 1 Corinthians 10. And that's what we started with. We started with replace the lies in our mind with spiritual truth, replace the lies. So remember, what are those lies in your mind you may have heard growing up, you're not good enough. You'll never amount to anything. You will never be good enough for Jesus. Your sins are too much. There's no way the blood would cover that. Is that the lies you need to hear and replace those with spiritual truth? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him should have everlasting life. 
Whoever confesses with their mouth becomes a Christ follower. That you are a new creation in Christ. All those truths. And then we talked about rewiring our thinking. We had to rewire because so many of us have, have, have been exposed to so many things that are of this world and they're not of the Lord. We need to rewire our thinking. Then we talked about reframing our response last week. You can't control what happens to you. You cannot control what the world dishes to you, but you can control how you respond. You can decide to flip your lid, which most of us do, and burn bridges and don't reflect Jesus very well. Or you can go, you know what? I'm going to really think about reframing my response more around the gospel than what I think it may be fair. Not more think how what I understand. Not flip my lid, not allow that primitive primate to come out going, aha, this is what they deserve. This is what they get. Going, man, how can I be more like Jesus? And then we finish today with rejoice and praise and prayer. How am I re rejoicing? Through praise and prayer to have a peace that surpasses all understanding that, that guards your heart and your mind. Your mind has a vital part in who you are in Christ. So take captive those thoughts and move forward. So if you're here today and you're like, well, I, I don't really know that Jesus guy, we'd love to introduce you to him. If you're here today and you're struggling with your thoughts, we, we would have a time where we just ask that you would spend some time in prayer, confessing that. I'm not real happy with where my thoughts are taking me. Or, or maybe just going back and listen to some of these past series. But we would ask that you begin to go, okay, how can I continue to keep my guard up? If you're here and you've learned something, you've grown from it, write it down, and then keep your guard up through praise and through prayer. Let's go to him in prayer. Lord, we come to you now full of thanks and praise. That one, we thank you for Pastor Craig Rochelle, who you put this book on his heart and he shares out of his own struggles and out of his own, uh, his own battles that he fought in his mind. But we have learned so much just from his teaching, but not only his teaching, but through the scripture that he pointed us to. We thank you for your scripture. And we talked about this, that it is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing and penetrating to the very heart and soul of who we are as men and women, as sons and daughters of the most high King. So God, I pray that you would just move in a mighty way. God, if there's, here, if there's someone here who doesn't know you, Lord, I pray that they would, today go, okay, I'm tired of hiding in a cave and I really wanna hear God. That they would submit themselves and they would understand they're sinners in need of a savior. God, if there are my brothers and sisters here today and they realize that their thoughts are taking them into places they don't wanna be, well, I pray they would confess that. They'd write that down. They would share that with other people and go, man, I need to really begin to win the war in my mind. Lord, if there are those who've been on this journey and they've realized they're losing more than they're winning, I pray they would just stay with it. We all lose more than we win in the beginning. But as time goes on, we get stronger. As time goes on, we get quicker. As time goes on, we keep our hands up more than we let them down. And we begin to keep our guard up. And as we keep our guard up, Lord, we have the strength to withstand the, the attacks that come at us. Or as Ephesians 6 says, that we have the shield of faith to hold off the fiery arrows of the enemy that come at us. We have the sword of the spirit, God's word to attack and to defend. And so Lord, I just pray, as I, even as I, as I say these, these scriptures that are hidden in my heart, that Lord, over the years you have put in my heart so that I can realize and understand it's not just my thoughts, God, but I need to capture my thoughts and have make them yours. Lord, you are so good. You are so faithful. I thank you that you love us even when we flip our lids. I thank you that you give us the patience when those around us flip their lids. And God, I just thank you that you give us the opportunity to praise and have conversation with you through prayer. And again, whether that's through, hey God, or whether it's a deep formal prayer, or whether it's just singing a song or drawing a picture, God, I pray that we would communicate with you, the living creator who created the brain, who gave us the scriptures, who's given us community to walk together successfully for your glory and for your kingdom. Your son's holy name we pray. Thanks again for joining us online at The Gathering. Today, our big idea was this. The Rejoice principle is about guarding our hearts and thoughts through praise and prayer. When we allow our thoughts to get hijacked by negative and worrisome thoughts, it's hard to win the war in our minds. Which is why we must focus on the Rejoice principle that changes our perspective to focus on the good and faithfulness of the Lord. When we do that, we have prayers that are an overflow 
of our praise and that will guard our hearts and our minds. Again, thank you for joining us online. We would love to connect with you. So if you will reach out to us through our social media platforms or through our website, we would love to get to know you better. We hope we'll see you in person soon at the gathering at Capstone. Have a great week and you're sent out.